Maybe you can speak a little bit more. So the the Stellarator and the Tokamak, what's the difference between those two? They're both magnetic fusion systems. And then what does Helion do? The Tokamak and the Stellarator are both magnetic systems. Their goal is to generate this magnetic field and hold on to the fusion fuel long enough. Like I mentioned, these charged particles are trapped on the magnetic field. In fact, they're oscillating. We call that a gyro orbit as the radius that they oscillate around this magnetic field. Um, and we're, we've been talking about atomic physics where everything is uh, at this nano scale. But gyro orbits are not. Gyro orbits for these fusion particles are measured in inches. And so th they're, they're in on a scale that, that, that we can see and measure and, and understand really intuitively. Um, and in a magnetic system, your goal is to simply trap as many of these particles as you can for long enough that, and heat them so they're hot enough so that they bang into each other. They collide enough that you're doing fusion. And you're doing enough fusion to overcome as fast as you're losing those particles. And so that's what, what happens when you put particles in a magnetic field and you try to hold on to it. The challenge is that's really hard to hold on to them long enough. These particles are moving around. They're moving at very high velocity, millions of miles per hour. They're colliding with each other and they're getting knocked off and getting knocked away. So we've talked about inertial fusion where you try to confine uh, a fusion plasma by crushing it as fast as possible. And magnetic fusion where you just simply have a magnetic field and your goal is to hold on to it for as long as possible. But there's another way to do fusion. And in some ways, it's one of the earliest approaches for fusion that was successful. Um, as scientists and engineers, maybe we're not too creative with the terminology, we call the technique that Helion uses magneto-inertial fusion because it does a little bit of both. So to understand that, we can actually go back in history a little bit and think about the evolution of some of these approaches to fusion. And so from our perspective, we look at the technology that we use as built on physics experiments that were very successful in the 1950s. Um, and in those systems, the earliest pioneers of fusion said, I know, we understand the physics, we have to take these gases, heat them to 100 million degrees, and then confine them, push them together so that fusion happens. And so what is the best way to do that? So the, some of the earliest programs, we called them the theta pinch. And what those programs were, were a linear topology because we knew how to build these magnets. Uh, it's called a solenoid, where you take a, a series of electric coils, you run electrical current through them, that generates a magnetic field. Great, so you have a magnetic field. Now you add your fusion particles, okay? So you've added fusion particles to this solenoid. Here's the challenge. Those particles, as they're sitting in that magnetic field in this nice magnet, escape. They leave out the ends, because there's nothing holding them in. Great, so that makes sense. Um, and so that doesn't work. Okay, so then the next approach is say, well, one, one branch of fusion said, okay, well, to solve that, why don't we take this solenoid and bend it around? Let's just make it a big donut. So as they're escaping, they go around and around in a circle. Great, that's a great approach. And so one branch of fusion went down that direction. And, and that became, that evolved into the Stellarator and the Tokamak, different ways of taking those solenoids and wrapping them around so that the plasmas go around and around in that magnetic field and our whole, those charged particles are held long enough that fusion happens. But there's a different way to do it. And so the theta pinch was what was born in the 1950s of take this magnetic field and, oh, they're trying to escape. Great. Let's not let them escape. Let's close the bottle. Mm -hmm. Let's close the ends. And so we make the magnetic field much stronger at the ends. This one was called the mirror. And so the idea was that the, the particles would bounce in between. And that worked, and they got hotter and hotter and hotter. But guess what? As you kind of would imagine, as this mirror topology, this linear topology, the pressure increased inside, the, the particle pressure, the, the particles tried to push back on the magnetic field. They were trying to escape now. They're, trying, they're getting hotter and hotter. And just as you imagine, hot gas in a balloon tries to get out the ends. And you could not hold it tight enough at the ends to keep those particles in. And in fact, the problem is the hottest ones were the ones that would escape. Mm -hmm. And so you do a good job of heating it and they'd all leave out the ends, okay? So then the next iteration has said, okay, well, why don't we just not try to hold on to it very long? Why don't we squeeze it? And so rather than just holding it constantly, let's now crush it. So we built this solenoid, we pinched the ends, and then we crushed it. And when, what I mean by crushing it is not actually like 
crushing any magnets or changing the, the, the topology or, or moving any parts, but just rapidly increasing the magnetic field. And so going from a magnetic field that's just holding it to now taking all those particles, if you imagine they were in a, a, a streaming around together and then rapidly increasing the magnetic field so that those particles get closer and closer, closer together. So you increase the density mm -hmm. and now fusion starts to really happen. But they ended up hitting a technological limit. So this is the part that that um, I look back and I'm, I look at the pioneers that in 1958, there was some pioneering work done. Um, and this was in California, what later became Livermore Labs. There was also some work done uh, at other national labs, too. These were all federally funded programs to explore this uh, theta pinch topology of can you just squeeze the plasma down fast enough, hard enough? This was 1958, the transistor was sitting in the laboratory and they were commuting, they were turning on millions of amps of electrical current. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it, we haven't talked about the timescales, but they were doing it in uh, millionths of a second, microseconds, megahertz speeds. Um, and this was in 1958, no transistor, no CPUs, and, um, and no electrical switches, none of the things that I take for granted every day. And so they were able to show at that time the highest performing fusion systems. Um, they got to temperatures. They didn't get to 100 million degrees, not quite then, but they got to 50 million degrees. They were outperforming everything else in fusion, but they reached a technical limit where they just could not build it anymore. And so they, the, those pioneers, went in a different direction and they started down the laser inertial path of saying like, okay, well, we can't do these uh, electromagnetic pinches, but we now have, this new thing has invented the laser, which turns on in a nanosecond. It's mm -hmm. fast. It's interesting. Let's go down that path. Um, and it's not, you have to fast forward a couple of decades to researchers found with some of these theta pinches, when they're operated in a very specific way, something else happened, something new happened. And that these plasmas where before they squeezed them very hard and just like squeezing a tube of toothpaste they squirted out the ends now it didn't squirt out the ends it actually pushed back it stayed confined it stayed trapped inside that linear topology even though the ends were open the plasma didn't leave and so there was a large amount of programs of like what is happening here this is an accidental discovery in plasma physics that something new is happening and what we discovered is we now call the field reverse configuration uh there's numerous programs of FRC, field reverse configuration programs, um, both at national labs. There's actually a number of private companies now of people building field reverse configurations. Um, and they have some really unique properties. But fundamentally, talking about the main difference, I described the solenoid with magnetic fields throughout the center of that volume and plasma trapped going back and forth. But some other things can happen, which is really interesting. And what they discovered early is if they have field going in one direction, so the plasma, the uh, electrical current is going around the loop and the plasma is going back and forth along this magnetic field line inside that solenoid, inside that theta patch. But then they change the direction of the magnetic field. And this is what we call field reversal. And this is really the key is that you start with the plasma going in one direction and then very rapidly you change the direction. You change the direction and reverse the direction of that field. And something really interesting happens, which is the plasma, this, fu this fusion fuel, these charged particles, which are trapped on the magnetic field lines um, that are moving back and forth, you change the direction. What that means is that there you're trying to take that electrical current and that magnetic field and reverts its direction, flip it. And, but it can't flip fast enough that the plasma is sitting there and you can't move the particles. And so what's really interesting is what happens is that because the particles can't move, but you've now flipped the direction of the magnetic field, you've, you've inverted it, something really, really unique happens, which is that the plasma itself can reconnects internally. And so now what you're left with is an outside magnetic field, an electrical coil, and inside the plasma where now it was, before it was moving along, it's now moving internally. Rapidly reversing the magnetic field, plasma self-organizes into a closed field. Mm -hmm. 
what? <laughs> yep. So it, how, it sounds wild. It's, 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 yeah. So, so first of all, there's a lot of, there's a million questions I have. So mm -hmm. one of them, what's rapidly, what time scale are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. You have to reverse the electrical current faster than a million degree, which is a very hot gas particle can move. And so that means we have to do it on the order of a millionth of a second. Wow. We have to do it in a millionth of a second. Wow. And, and so in practice, <laughs> this is hard. Yeah. And it's only, we can only do it now because of semiconductor switching. Mm -hmm. Because we can, we can move things, we can switch things like the transistor in every CPU in a computer switches at a gigahertz. That means in a nanosecond, it's switching in a billionth of a second. Mm -hmm. And so now, which we didn't in the 1950s when these theta pinches were invented, but now we have the semiconductors to be able to do that. The self-organizing plasma, mm -hmm. can you just speak to that? What the heck is it doing? How do we discover, how do we understand the self-organizing mechanism, the dynamics of the plasma that it's able to contain itself? So what I like to do is use an analogy here of once you've made it, it's actually somewhat straightforward to understand. Getting to it is tricky. And how they discovered it the first time is absolutely amazing. But once you've made it, it's a lot, it's a lot more straightforward to understand. So in a magnetic coil, when you have an, a, a round electrical coil, you have electrical current flowing in that coil. And if you have a conductor, if you have another, a metal inside that coil, and this is called Lenz's law, in one of the Maxwell equations, is that as you have electrons and you have current flowing in that coil, an equal and opposite electrical current is induced in a piece of metal nearby. This is the same thing that happens in a transformer, uh, where you have a primary on a transformer and you have electricity flowing it, and you have a secondary where electricity flows exactly the opposite direction. We use this every day in, in, in our lives. And so, in this in condition, you have a conductor, an electrical conductor where current can flow, and you have an electrical current flowing on the outside, electrical current flows on the inside. Um, and in that case, now you, I, I've described uh, two pieces of metal. Now, let's go one step further, and that inner conductor is not a piece of metal anymore. It's one of these high temperature gases, this plasma, this charged particles. So now you have current, electrical current flowing in the plasma. And this is really, really interesting. We talked about these charges moving back and forth. Well, moving electrical charges is current. So in every plasma condition we've talked about, the tokamak, um, the theta pinch, the stellarator, there's electrical current flowing in the plasma. But in the field reverse configuration, you have a lot of electrical current flowing in the plasma, massive amounts of it. And that's the key. So you have the center core where electrical current is flowing in this transformer, if you want to think about it primary and secondary. And here's the craziest part of it. This electrical current, what, how did I describe a magnet? An electromagnet is a loop that has electrical current flowing in it that generates a magnetic field. And for a theta pinch, and for a mirror, and for a tokamak, in that magnetic field, the plasma gets trapped. But in an FRC, this electrical current is the plasma. And that, electric, that plasma then generates its own magnetic field. And it's then trapped on its own magnetic field. That's fascinating. And, and that's the key. And so in your tokamak, in your donut, in your and in your funky donut, your stellarator, mm -hmm. you make the magnets and you trap your plasma in it. In an FRC, you make the plasma, which makes the magnets, and it traps itself.